The next topic that I want to talk about is comes from Chapter 4, Music Notation. Right? Uh, particularly for older music, uh, since uh, recorded technology has only been with us for uh, not that long, um, music notation has been the way that we've been able to replicate music that has been gone for hundreds and hundreds of years, sometimes even thousand years old of music there we're able to replicate due to a system of music notation that has been passed down from generation to generation there. So um, while I don't require you to um, uh, be able to read music in this uh, particular system, it does help to know a little bit about how this uh, music notation system works here. Music usually falls on what we call uh, is written on a staff, at least melodic music here, and harmonic music is written on a staff of five lines and four spaces. And when you play or sing notes, uh, uh, and those are represented on various lines and spaces, at least their pitch is represented by the way that they're played here. So for example, here, this is an E, and then on the next space is an F, G, a, B, C, D, E. If you look at the diagram on page 34 in your textbook there, you'll see the um, way that the uh, uh, notes, at least as far as the United States is concerned, we usually associate every white key on the keyboard with uh, a letter of the alphabet, and we only use the first seven letters of the alphabet, that being A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and just repeats all over and over again, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all right? Notice as I played notes that go higher on the staff, then they went up on the staff, and of course the pitch goes higher, and as you go lower on the staff, then of course the notes um, go uh, lower in pitch there, all right? Um, we use two different staffs. I mean, there's actually more than uh, two different staffs, uh, systems that we use, but the most commonly used ones are the treble clef here. Let me uh, show you here the treble clef. Uh, this top one notates usually the um, uh, pitches that are in the higher range there, everything from middle C and above there, all right? And then underneath that, we have the bass clef, which of course covers the lower range of pitches there, everything from middle C and below there. All right? You notice that when you go, when you run out of lines or spaces, we actually create lines which we call ledger lines, and that allows us to expand beyond just the uh, limit of just the five lines and four spaces on the staff. The next aspect of music that I wish to discuss with you is melody. In chapter 5, we discuss melody here, and what a definition of melody is, is that a melody is a succession of single pitches that can be heard as a recognizable whole. Now, what is it that about a melody that can make it a recognizable whole? I think there's a couple different factors here which, I, uh, which make it recognizable. One is that the melody needs to have a sense of shape or direction, right? shape or direction, that it doesn't just stay in one spot there, but... Uh, that it tends to move somewhere. Number two, that if it's going to move somewhere, then it should have a climax to it, or it's usually the high point in a melody here. And also, uh, that the melody has to have a sense of cadence. That there, uh, What I mean by cadence is that there are stopping places in the melody or in the music that give it a sense of conclusion, whether it be a temporary uh, sense of cadence or a real final cadence here. Right. For example, if I played this Mozart uh, melody for you from his piano, one of his piano sonatas, some of you may have heard this before. What makes that melody so recognizable that so many people know this melody even hundreds and hundreds of years after it was composed? is because of the shape and direction with it here, all right? As I said before, it tends to go somewhere. Right? Has a sense of cadence also, that it stops, but then also that it keeps on going somewhere. There's your climax, the real high point of the melody. So if you're thinking of becoming famous like Mozart one day there, those are some of the tips that you could do to kind of create a, a tuneful melody um, by giving it some sense of shape and direction, um, a sense of climax, and also a sense of cadence. The next aspect of music that I want to talk to you about is harmony. 
chapter six covers harmony. And what harmony is, is the way that chords are constructed and how they follow each other. Um, and we talked about the melodic aspect of having one note travel from one to the next there. But when notes are happening simultaneously, we call those, when we have three or more tones sounded at once, we call that a chord. Right? A chord is uh, when you have simultaneous tones sounding at, uh, well, of course, simultaneously there. Uh, whereas a melody is a series of individual notes there. Now, the way that these groups of notes move together, chords, um, uh, that uh, follows a progression. And our ears interpret that in such a way to determine what the music is expressing as well. With that, there are what we call uh, instances of consonance and dissonance. When we hear some stable or restful chords, we call those consonant chords all right, that are pleasing to the ear. Throughout music history, the definition of what sounded consonant to the ears has uh, evolved over the years here. So some things that we may have we may believe are consonant these days, maybe a thousand years ago, they did not believe it was so uh, consonant there. Um, However, sometimes when you hear some unstable chords, something that sounds tense, like that chord here, all right, we call those dissonant chords. Those are, there's various degrees of dissonances here. All right? Some uh, we have here, but particularly in the 20th century, you'll notice that there's a lot of uh, music that really has some striking, um, more shock value type of dissonances uh, uh, to express a certain emotion in the music there. But probably what I think uh, drives most of Western culture music is this, this ebb and flow between dissonance and consonance here. And we call it, when we move from a dissonance to a consonance, we call that resolution. So when we play, there's a dissonance, and then there's a consonance there, all right? So it has a sense of completion there. And the harmonies, the way that the tones interact with one another, we can instinctively sometimes hear some of those uh, dissonance and consonances there, but sometimes being aware of some of those harmonies helps clarify those senses of resolution when going from a dissonance to a consonance. To illustrate how harmony can play a big role in determining what how a, a piece uh, expresses a certain type of emotion, turn in your books to page 43 and 44. There's this prelude in E minor for piano. It's written by the Polish composer Frederick Chopin. Um, this is a uh, good dates all the way back to 1839 and um, this is a particular case here where if you look on page 44 the listening outline um, the melody isn't really anything to be very memorable it doesn't it's not exactly a memorable melody of uh, based off of the definition that we had if I play just the right hand here here's what the right hand looks like So not the most exciting thing. It doesn't seem to go anywhere there. However, what's, what makes this such a masterful piece is the harmonies that are changing underneath the movements from consonances to dissonances here. Let me play just the opening for you so you can see what I mean here. So all that movement from dissonances to consonances is, is what kind of makes gives it that melancholy feel or, you know, we tend to associate uh, more serious music with the, the dissonant and also uh, minor sounds here. And Chopin is kind of a master of uh, manipulating the harmonies in such a manner to tug at the heartstrings of his listeners.